Welcome to Hargill, Texas, a friendly town known for its cook-offs, cotton, and a sense of community. It's also the home of an exciting new agricultural venture. In today's episode of Discover Texas, we'll meet Manny Scaria, owner and founder of U.S. Citrus. Through the process he calls micro-budding, he's revolutionizing the entire citrus industry. And in the process, he's turned his company into the number one U.S. producer of Persian lines. Join us as we discover the sometimes sweet, sometimes tart, but always fascinating world of citrus. It's time to hit the road and discover Texas with Annie Studebaker. Get ready to travel deep into the heart of the Lone Star State, meeting friendly folks and exploring fascinating places. Experience a way of life like nowhere else in the world. As we uncover the rich history and culture of Texas, discover adventure, discover excitement, Discover Texas with Annie Studebaker. My name is Manny Scaria. I'm the founder and the CEO of U.S. Citrus in Hargill, Texas. And prior to that, I have uh, 25 years with the Texas a &M University as a professor and a citrus scientist in West Laco, Texas. U.S. Citrus is a a company that I founded in 2012 based on about uh, almost 20 some years of uh, passion for uh, citrus um, and to use the knowledge and the creativity that I have developed into a commercial operation and uh, to bring innovations into citrus production agriculture. I don't know how I got into citrus. Uh, when I go back to, to find out how it happened, I think it is uh, God's plan. Manny Scaria's interest in plants has taken him around the world, from far off India to Indiana's Purdue University, on to the apple orchards of Washington State University. It was there as a plant pathologist that he received a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, right after my PhD from Purdue University in 1984, I got an opportunity to be on a USAID project along with the Washington State University in Jordan. At that time, I didn't know much about citrus at all. So I learned, I picked up information by working with the technicians and professors in various universities on citrus. And then, but the majority of information came from working in the trenches of citrus in the Jordan Valley. In that project, there were four other professors who they taught me a lot about citrus. And after that, uh, my, I got a call from my mentor and a colleague, uh, Dr. John Fusick, who was a horticulturist at the Texas a &M University asked me, do I like to get a job with the Texas a &M University? So I applied for it, I interviewed, and I got the job. I came to West Loco, Texas, and I saw that in, in Texas, um, people were complaining in, an ex in a typical extension meeting. I see people, those who are very elderly, walk into the conference room and they complain that they are not making good money. Whereas, when I was in Washington State, what I have seen is most of them are young faces and they're happy. Their tone was different because they were in, a, in an industry that was making money. They want to expand, they want to bring new varieties, products, and there was all enthusiasm there. But we're in uh, West Laco, Texas in 1980s and early 1990s, what I have experienced was a, say, an entirely different picture. So as a young scientist, I took note of that one. So I asked Dr. Fusick, how come when I interviewed for this position, one thing that I remembered Everybody in the interview board said that, you know, oh, we are the best uh, um, grapefruit producing state in the, in the world. And our grapefruit is so wonderful. And it was true. And it is still true. It, it, we make the best delicious fruit, grapefruit in the world. But the growers didn't get the money for that. So there is a disconnect. So I asked Dr. Fusick, why is that? He said, there are several reasons. Marketing the freezes we had and uh, the one comment that uh, Dr. Fusick said at that time was the growers, Texas growers can make 
a much better return on investment in their early years if they are willing to plant more trees per acre. For example, instead of 125 trees, he wanted to plant uh, 500 trees. Uh, he showed that through many years of research and demonstration. But for some reason, it did not click. So, the reason was that there is an initial investment, an added initial investment because when you invest money, too much money into trees in the beginning. Then uh, I thought I had the problem. And the problem was there is somehow I need to reduce the cost of the trees. When I was with Washington State University, I saw a rapid increase in the apple tree density, tree planting density from 100 plus trees per acre, they went up to 1,500 to 2,500 trees today per acre. That was a tremendous um, improvement or a revolutionary change in the citrus product, uh, planting uh, cultural practices. So I had, that, I had the privilege of seeing that one. The apple industry was years ahead when it came to utilizing dwarfing rootstocks and advanced pruning techniques in an effort to pack more trees per acre and gain higher fruit yields faster. Unfortunately, these innovations didn't translate well into the world of citrus. In order to take advantage of the ideas being used in Washington, Dr. Scaria would have to create something new and different. Normally, the fruit trees are grafted with a method called tea budding. In the standard tea budding process, a tea shape is cut into the bark. The bark is peeled, so creating a little pouch. And a bud is inserted into that pouch and the stem is wrapped tightly and it is left to heal. This is a long process, usually takes about 12 to 18 months of nursery time. And before that, the rootstock has to reach a certain pencil size and that is a nine month process. Also, this tea budding is a seasonal process. It happens only in the spring or in the early summer or fall. And through the tea budded trees, it takes about three to four years after the trees planted in the field to get a commercial harvest of fruit. We have a technology to place that bud on the top. And it is a small bud, that's why I call it micro bud which can be two to three months old. So there is no need for preparing the rootstock for a nine month period for the conventional budding. And once the micro bud is done, you wait for another month before you transplant into the field. So you have almost uh, 18 months of savings of time. And then once you plant that into the field, there is no need for a six months re-establishment time. It will take off very fast and the micro butter trees are known to produce fruit in less than half time. So in essence, it saves a lot of time. Time means money and that is the essence of this uh, micro butter technology compared to conventional uh, production. Think about that. Smaller trees using up fewer resources, taking up less land, bearing fruit faster. It's just incredible. Why wouldn't everyone want a tree like that at home? This can be shipped anywhere in the country for a very, in a very cost-effective manner. For example, we ship boxes like this one. This is what you get. All this was amazing to hear but I had to see it in person. When we return, Manny will take us on a tour of one of his greenhouses and show us the extraordinary things he's doing with his micro-budding technique. Hold on to your hat, we'll be right back. This is an amazing, never-ending greenhouse. It's, it's more than I expected, really. Well, and it this is, is one of the seven or eight now. And we have 10 more we are building. Oh my goodness. But there's so many per square foot here. Yes, uh, in a conventional citrus nursery, in one square foot, it, it takes about a square foot for a tree to make it into a gallon. But here, it is about 49 of them. Per square foot? For a per square foot. My goodness, and so you have so many. So if you look at that many. one, look at the square foot um, efficiency. This is the largest citrus production 
uh, place in the world in terms of efficiency of space. Definitely, I can tell. Good grief. Sure. Come on, let's go. This is amazing. <gasps> wow. What have we got here? Here, I want to give a small demonstration okay. of a field planting. Okay. For example, the plants in this tray represents the number of plants that normally people plant in one acre area. Oh, okay. So if, you, if these were conventional trees, these many plants would would fill one fill acre. One acre. Yeah. I got you. With okay. one exception, those trees will be like the size of this man. Okay, correct. So this will be this taking will, up a lot of space. A lot of space. And to reach that one, and this will be equivalent wow. to one acre okay. of plants. Okay. So whereas in our system of operation, the US Citrus Way. No way. Here, from here to 10 trays there in one is acre. one acre. No way, no wonder your production of citrus is abundant. This is amazing. You can fit all of these trees in one acre? We can fit, and the, you can fit it ten, trays. 10 times, 10 times more. You can <gasps> fit it, but the challenge is to keep it fit for several years. And that we have, you know, uh, we have learned that wow. technique. Wow, yeah, definitely. Amazing. This is very, very interesting. Thank you. So, how long does a citrus tree normally last? The largest one I know, the age is about 150 years old in Italy. And the, and, uh, the largest one I have seen um, in California is about 90 years old in the field. So, a citrus wow. tree can be alive for more than 100 years if there is no disease or there is no freeze or there is no nat natural disaster. Yes, for sure. But wow. if you bring some natural disaster into the equation, it's about 20 years, two decades. And that's plenty. Wow. So these are ready to go in the field? Yeah, yeah. This so is, you plant them this small? This small. And we do not want, see, this is what conventional people plan and this takes about two years. I just don't want to toss it. <laughs> I can see now that you definitely favor that, but I can see why now. Because my babies, this one, <laughs> we pull them out, plant them in the field, and in two years' time, they'll be much, much bigger than this one. This tree is a calamandin. There's fruit on the trees already. That's the beauty <gasps> of uh, like microbiome. This. It's a Chinese orange, very popular among Chinese people. Everybody you know, likes that one. Uh, this is uh, less than about 18 months old. You eat so the yes, whole thing. You can, you can eat the whole thing. <laughs> nice! Wow, this is different. What is this, Manny? And this, even this fruit is different. Yes, this is what is called a variegated pink lemon. It's the pink fruit, inside? The fruit inside is pink. And let us check it out. I'm going to pluck it. Huh. Oh, yes. Can I squeeze it? Yes. How is it? Mm. It's lemony. Yes, it is lemony. Man, this is good for um, this a is lemonade. A very, the, yeah, this is a very mm. specialty item and it is uh, in good demand, especially in European countries. I heard that the European uh, stores, they sell at a, a pound a, a piece. A pound? A, a pound a piece, British pound. This stage to this stage can be two years. Unbelievable. And it's fruiting already. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. This is the way that's to go. That's the magic. That's yeah. the new outlook for oh, citrus. You're making magic with yeah. citrus, that's for sure. Okay, show me some more. What have you got over okay, here? Okay, here it is. This one is uh, called a Ponderosa lemon. It's big and um, uh, you can use it for uh, uh, to make a, uh, the lemonade. Lemonade. And also to make, a, in, uh, in my part of the country and back in India, we use this one heavily for making pickles. Wow, you have to show me yes, how I you will make pickles. Show it. This one 
is a Mexican lime, but it is a thornless Mexican lime. The regular Mexican lime has lots of thorns in it. Okay. So this is uh, you know, produced in the uh, University of California. It doesn't have any thorns. And My goodness. Uh, here, we talked about this one earlier. <gasps> and what is that? Look at this. This looks like fingers. Oh my goodness. This, this is citrus? This is citrus. It is <gasps> called a, a finger citron or Buddha's hand. No kidding. Buddha's hand. And this is uh, traditionally used in Chinese and uh, East Asian you know, culture. They use it for candy, so they keep the leaves in the closets to get rid of smell. There's a lot of volatile, you know, so the oil in it, and it is all pulpy inside. And fortunately, I don't want to cut that. I have only two of this one. No problem. Yeah. You don't have to, but yeah. I'm, well, I've never seen anything like that. It was an amazing sight. The plants I saw were so young, but so many of them were already bearing fruit. And this is our flagship Persian lime in a Texas planter. And uh, we can give any kind of affiliations for Texas A&M or uh, UT or uh, I'll put some Purdue also there. Uh, see, see, look at the number of fruit yeah, on this one. Yeah, these are just babies, right? Th those are babies. Because the one you showed me was much yeah, bigger. And wow. this, is, this is getting there. Let's cut this one. Mm -mm -mm. And that, look at that. See. <gasps> Ooh. So we, the beauty mm. of that one is we make limes with lots of juice. That is a lot what, of juice. What, what that is Persian lime with plenty of juice. That is a lot and of juice. No, not only that, you, we can sell it with confidence that our customers can get this one and put it in their drink. There won't be any pesticides on this fruit. Wow, that's amazing. Are these okay? They're all wrinkled. Yes, but that's the, that's the beauty part of it. It's really? A, it's a wrinkled beauty. Oh, I see them all wrinkled. My see, goodness. So what are they called? This is kaffir lime. Smell it. Oh, my goodness. Yes. It's citrusy, but yet it's a very special Very special smell. one. This is heavily used in Philippine cuisines. Uh, for their soup and all kinds of food and uh, even the leaves are used to uh, see smell this leaf So lots of essential oil in oh, it. Oh, yes. yes Boy that almost does not look healthy, but it just smells delicious. Yeah, no, the, the smell of it is uh, it's, uh, it's loaded with essential oils Okay, Manny, you told me this plant right here is citrus. How is that possible? It is a type of citrus called Australian finger lime. Okay. Uh, Erimo citrus. Uh, look at the fruit here, and we have another plant with... Oh, uh, this oh little here is here is another is? one. Um, oh, it's see, got one see, of these see, little pods in see, there. See these uh, fruits here? Those are limes. Those there. are the finger lime. Wow. And uh, finger lime is called also called the citrus caviar, and um, they, it has lots of vesicles inside. You put it in the refrigerator, take it out and cut it, and the vesicles will ooze out, and it is unbelievable sensation when you put it on your tongue. Really? And uh, the it's a rare item. It was introduced from Australia legally into the United States, um, and. Uh, there's a company in Australia that, from in California that sells this fruit. I think last time when I checked it out, it was about $24 a pound. And look at the flowers. Gosh, it's already blooming. I see the little flowers. Yeah. Lots of blooms. And the beauty of that one is instead of five years in the field, we can get it to production in little over two years. My goodness. Oh, this is a kumquat. Oh, Comcourt yes. Is, uh, the little bitty oranges. The little bitty oranges. Yes. And that will be, when it is mature, that will be this color. And it, uh, you can eat the whole thing. <gasps> Look at that. Can I eat this one? Yes, you can. You may eat it. Mm. And these are green. Mm. You can even eat the skin. You, you can eat the really whole good. thing. Yes. I love it. Yes. Very good. Mm-hmm. I ate it all. Again, kumquat is a... Uh, Chinese favorite. This mm -hmm. will go wild in the during the Chinese New Year time. 
because they will use this as a gift to give it to other people. Interesting. Okay. Wow, this is a huge variety of citrus trees that you have. Thank you. And uh, we have a lot of people work here who so made this thing happen. Yes. So that I can talk about it. That's so nice. That's so nice. Wow, Manny, who would have thought that in Hargill, Texas, you have such a beautiful and successful operation of citrus? Good grief, so many trees. Well, it's very funny, Annie, what you said, because actually it is making me very nervous. Nervous? Because I have to fulfill my own expectations and other people's expectations on me. Well, that says a lot about you because you consider yourself and everyone else as well. This is wonderful. Thank Good you. for you, Manny. Thank you. This morning I got up with a thought okay. and I shared with my colleagues at the US Citrus as a text message early morning at uh, 6.50 in the morning. I'm going to read it to you. The foundation of a possible impact and legacy of Manny's career and his new outlook for Citrus starts with the number of full-time jobs he would create in a rural Hargill and its surroundings. Manny's career, June 27, 2017. Passing through Hargill, most people wouldn't stop and think that here, in this one square mile town, an agricultural revolution is taking place. But thanks to Dr. Manny Scaria and his team at U.S. Citrus, that's exactly what's happening. Their hard work is changing the face of the citrus industry, benefiting not only South Texas, but the entire world. I'm Annie Studebaker. Join me next time as we discover Texas.